Okay. And people that are on Zoom, um, I'll try to check the chat if you send me something, but um, hopefully I won't miss your question if you, you send something along. Otherwise, your best chance is probably just to, to speak up. Okay. Um, so let's get started. All right. So this is just a general introduction to animal movement ecology. Um, and I'll cover a little bit of both behavioral state estimation and space use in this, just kind of getting everyone oriented. So just a general background here. Um, movement ecology and movement in general is fundamental to life history and fitness of organisms. So in general, or almost all organisms need to move to achieve different aspects of their life history. Um, and a study of this movement, often via telemetry devices, especially over the past 20 to 30 years um, has allowed a variety of different analyses to be conducted. Um, so everything starting with like VHF radio telemetry, which was a lot more coarse, um, more difficult to get um, high resolution kind of frequent uh, observations to now satellite telemetry in different forms, acoustic telemetry. telemetry. Um, so there's all these other kind of advances we've had recently. And a lot of times researchers want to estimate the space use and hidden behavioral states or latent behavioral states from these animal tracks. Obviously there's plenty of other things that you could do with these tracks, um, which is what's so cool about, I would say animal telemetry in general. Um, but there is this science, science paper, nature paper from Ron Nathan and colleagues this past year um, talking about big data and animal movements. And I think this provides kind of like a nice schematic of a general study design for animal movements, um, where you have this data collection phase where it's accounting for all these different types or sources of data from these different uh, bio loggers or tags and uh, ways that you can essentially accomplish investigating animal movement in some form or another. Um, and after you've done so, then you get to this data processing phase where you could be doing things like data exploration, maybe filtering and smoothing the tracks, um, and then getting to a point where you're modeling the tracks. And then ultimately what a lot of people want to accomplish with these tagged animals is to estimate space use with maybe methods such as kernel density estimation. Uh, maybe they're interested in resource or habitat selections. They might use a step selection function. And then another potential interest is behavioral states. And one way to achieve that is with hidden Markov modeling. Um, <clears throat> so the focus of this workshop is on these kind of first and third topics here at the bottom, uh, space use estimation and behavioral state estimation. And I'm planning to host another workshop, I think the beginning of the spring, um, where I'll focus more on habitat selection. Um, so we'll cover at least step selection functions in some part of that. Um, but this is kind of a general workflow for how people might investigate um, different questions in animal movement ecology. So um, if you haven't read it before or heard of it, there was this Ron Nathan paper from 2008 that essentially kind of describes or proposes this movement ecology paradigm. Um, but in general, if we think about a track before I get into that, we initially might think looking at kind of like a really fine scale, um, we have this track and it's made up of just consecutive points from where these, these tags were transmitting. Um, so it's not showing up super well just because of the lighting here, but um, we have like each of these points are labeled so like time T, time T plus two plus five, whatever it is. We have like a bunch of points here in the middle then the others are kind of spaced out. Um, so we might be able to make some inferences about what the, this animal is doing on a fine temporal scale. Um, and we look to this next phase, if we zoom out a little bit, we have these two kind of large clusters of movements um, where presumably they're searching for food, but then in between they're escaping a predator. And that's what's been zoomed in on here. Um, so you might be able to make different ecological inferences just based on this track compared to this track. And if you zoom out even further to essentially the entire lifetime of this individual, 
Um, you cover everything from birth to death. And this is just one small facet of this track. Um, so depending on like the temporal scale of the track that you're looking at, um, you might come to different conclusions about what the animal is doing. <clears throat> so this is essentially the, the movement ecology paradigm that was proposed by Nathan and colleagues where they have these different um, variables that essentially that are driving a lot of these processes. Um, so we have some internal ones or individual based ones here that are kind of in this yellow ellipse and then external that are in this light blue ellipse here. So focusing on the individual, we have things such as the internal states. So why would the animal move? Um, this might impact things such as navigation capacity. So whether they're following scent trails, maybe geomagnetic fields, all kinds of other things um, related to navigation. And this can in turn affect potentially motion capacity. So how they're moving. Um, this also depends on what kind of environment they're in, what medium. So whether it's an aquatic organism, whether they're volant, so they're flying, they're arboreal, all kinds of things will impact how they're moving. <clears throat> and this can ultimately impact that path. So the shape of the path, how they're moving in two dimensions, but also in three dimensions, um, regardless of whether they're terrestrial or uh, aquatic. And a lot of times we're going to assume that there are external factors that are influencing these movements, whether it's uh, biophysical variables, <clears throat> in the environment itself or interactions with other conspecifics or um, other species in general. Um, so this is kind of the, the movement ecology paradigm proposed that's kind of shaped a lot of what the field looks like today. Um, <clears throat> so taking kind of like a, a big picture view here of movement ecology, I'm gonna focus on like some of what can be done um, with animal telemetry data. And again, a lot of the focus for this particular workshop is going to be on um, satellite telemetry in some form, um, but a lot of these things could potentially be done with acoustic telemetry as well, depending on that type of data. <clears throat> so the first major topic here that I'm going to discuss is space use. So this could be investigated by individual or an entire population of a species. Um, you could be interested in things such as temporal patterns, so diurnal patterns over the course of a day seasonal patterns, um, all kinds of things. <clears throat> Relationships with marine protected areas, if it's a marine organism. So how much of a protected area is a given individual using and does that differ across individuals of a population or only during a breeding season versus the rest of the year? Um, you could also make comparisons among life stages. So juveniles versus adults or other intermediate life stages and also potentially determining centers of activity. So what areas are the, these individuals primarily using? And maybe you would later tie that to different um, <clears throat> environmental variables of some sort. Um, so here's a image from Dryman and colleagues from a couple years ago, looking at, I think it was tarpon in the Gulf of Mexico and showing some hotspots essentially of, of space use here. <clears throat> you can also look at behavioral states, which I mentioned before. And this is essentially getting at what the animal is doing. So when we tag individuals, it's often because, especially in aquatic environments, we can't see them, especially as readily as in terrestrial environments. So we want to kind of make inferences about what they might have been doing when they were unobserved. And things you can do with this data include such a thing, such as characterizing activity budgets. So how much time do they spend in a certain behavior versus another one? And that might be able to be used in relation to uh, energy budget models. So how much energy are they burning? And is that impacted due to anthropogenic effects? Um, how does that impact uh, foraging, searching for food? What type of food they consume? Um, and you can also potentially use this for the identification of possible movement or migratory corridors, as well as identifying foraging grounds. And then lastly, um, there's habitat selection or habitat suitability. So what type of habitat does this animal prefer? Um, do these uh, preferences change by season, age, or sex? Um, are there differences in habitat preferences by behavioral state? Um, and can these differences be expected due to climate change? Um, so there's all kinds of questions you can ask related to habitat or resource selection. <clears throat> 
as well. Um, so I have these, these other figures here. The one on the top left is a loggerhead turtle, um, I think in the Northwest Atlantic. And it's essentially looking at uh, these two behavioral states and um, this vector field underneath is showing ocean currents. So kind of identifying that this ocean advective current is kind of carrying or help propel this individual and making transport easier from one location to another. Um, and the bottom is looking, I think, at green turtles in the Caribbean and looking at uh, habitat selection, at least in this figure related to distance to seagrass um, and looking at patterns, um, dial patterns. So differences between day and night and then showing this plot of seagrass next to it. Um, but again, like I mentioned before, the focus of this workshop is going to be these top two topics. Um, so space use and behavioral states. So these are often investigated, but why is it important or why bother estimating space use and behavior? So characterizing the spatial temporal patterns of space use is often fundamental to ecology about just what the animal is doing, what resources it's using, etc. cetera. Um, so ultimately we wanna know where the animal is going. Um, so I have a figure here from Shimada and colleagues from last year um, that's showing a method essentially related to how do you know your sample size is large enough to estimate the utilization distribution of a set of individuals. Um, but also related to behavior. So this kind of modified quote from Dobchansky. So originally nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And I'm kind of modifying that to say that nothing in animal movement ecology makes sense except in the light of behavior. Um, so ultimately a lot of times you can't make real inferences about what the animal might've been doing, what it preferred um, without knowing why it was doing that. So what behavioral drivers might be there to guide the space use, to guide the resource selection patterns. Um, so a lot of things underlying these other aspects of movement ecology could in large part be due to these behavioral um, patterns. And we see some results here from a hidden Markov model on the right for um, some type of pinniped, some type of seal, where they estimated three different behavioral states here. Um, so to get into behavioral states uh, more specifically here, since that's the, the topic for today, um, so what are latent behavioral states? You might've seen this in the literature if you've done some reading related to this. Um, so latent meaning hidden. Um, that's what it's typically meant for the statistical literature. If you ever look at different models and it's referred to as like a latent variable model, it's either hidden or unobserved variable. Um, so we don't see it. So in this case, the true states, the true behaviors are not directly observed. We can only infer them from the tracks that we've collected. And then we call them behavioral states more often than not compared to just behaviors since we're not directly observing the behaviors that these animals are doing. Um, so I think this figure to the right is um, pretty apt in uh, showing this. So we have this time series on the top um, where we see displacements of this animal. And a model has been used to identify three different behavioral states here based on displacement. So really low levels of displacement are related to being in an encamped behavioral states. Intermediate levels are called meandering. And then everything that's higher um, level of displacement are referred to as a directed walk. Um, and when we see this plot on the bottom right, I know these words, this text, it's kind of hard to read for everyone that's here in the room. Um, but essentially it's identifying these coarser types of states. So the directed walk, meandering and encamped but each of these can comprise multiple different types of actual behaviors. So in red, these could either be like a resource directed movement or a range shift. So 3A, these different pieces here are resource directed movements, whereas here 3B is a range shift. Um, in green, these could either be social behaviors or foraging. And then this orange gold um, could either be a reproductive event, resting or intensive foraging. So these are all the things that ideally we wish we knew. And if you have really high temporal resolution data, you might be able to uncover. But a lot of times this is all we can come up with are these coarser behavioral states. So that's often what people are estimating when they, they use these types of models. 
So moving on to actual behavioral state classification. And this is looking at this really broad view. So like 4,000 foot view, 40,000 foot view. Um, so to kind of just give a sampling of what different types of models are available, I'm using this table from Garari and colleagues. Um, that had a really nice paper from 2016 um, about behavioral state estimation. So they break this up into four different categories. These could be kind of potentially rearranged, um, but I think this does a, a decent job of organizing these. So these four categories include something that's metric based. Um, so this could be a tortuosity or straightness measurement or index. Some of you may have heard of first passage time or residence time metrics. Um, so it's almost a lot of times using some type of threshold to define what's one behavior versus another one. There's also classification and segmentation models. Um, and these take multiple different forms. Um, so there's even such things like K-means clustering, another type of residence time uh, model, something called Bayesian partitioning modeling, penalized contrast. So there's things that might break up a track into different segments and then classify those segments together into different behavioral states. Uh, third is phenomenological time series analysis. This might include things related to autocorrelation. Um, there's behavioral change point analysis, which looks for breakpoints in that movement track um, to identify these, these periods where behaviors are more or less the same and then where there might be a shift. Um, there's also the, such things such as wavelet analysis so these all are focused more on time series of tracks specifically. And then lastly, you get into your mechanistic or process-based movement models. And this is, I think, what's dominating the field right now um, with things such as state-based modeling and hidden Markov modeling, which I'll be covering today. Um, and to give kind of a overview of what at least like a classification segmentation model might look like, we start with this actual continuous movement path or trajectory here at the very top. Um, but what we actually find in our data are these observations. So we have these distinct points in time that define this track um, that are essentially a semblance of this real true track. And there's multiple ways we can analyze this, but in this example, um, let's say we break this up into a variable called step lengths. So the distance between consecutive points here so this is like essentially a histogram of those step lengths. So primarily short step lengths with some uh, larger ones occasionally, but there's few of them. And we can look at a time series of step length and see that it starts off really low and then starts to increase rapidly. Um, and let's say for, if you would use this classification segmentation model of some sorts, you identify different segments here. So each of these numbers are labeling a different segment of this track that could comprise of one or more of these observations based on how similar these segments are to different points. And then ultimately each segment um, is broken away from the track as a whole and different segments are clustered together separately into behavioral states. Um, so again, this is only one potential way to identify behavioral states, but just giving you an idea of what's um, possible. And another similar type of plot. So the top one is showing a metric based approach where let's say you have um, two different variables here that are referred to on this plot as path signals. And let's say you take the average for both of them. So anything in these different quadrants constitutes a different behavior or a different state. And that's how you label these points. Um, and that's not really, um, I think as useful as some other methods. So it's typically not used that much anymore. Um, this plot in the middle is showing the sliding moving window across this time series of a given variable and identifying different breakpoints um, by where these changes in this, this path is occurring. Um, and then the bottom is showing one of those like mechanistic process-based models, such as in this case, like a, a hidden Markov model. Um, and you see that there's a different histogram or a different distribution for each behavior for in this case, let's say it's step length again. Um, so the colors blue and red are indicating these different behavioral states. So there's, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot of different methods. There's, they each work in very different ways. So this may feel 
overwhelming at times. Um, so I'm going to do my best to try to make everything as clear as possible. But if you do have any questions, just feel free to stop me. And I'll, I'll try to go through it a little bit. Um, and then again, these resources will be left up on the website to refer to later. If at some point, let's say you don't come back to this for a few months before you analyze your data. So what can behavioral state estimates be used for? Some of what I mentioned previously um, can be used to characterize activity budgets. So they can provide into insight into the behavioral state frequency over a given time period. Um, and again, this could be the dial. So day, night, uh, seasonal, annual, um, all kinds of things. So showing some figures from a, a paper I have in review right now on giant armadillos and the uh, Brazilian Pantanal. Um, <clears throat> this figure doesn't look quite nice, but at least to show what the behaviors are that were estimated from this model. There's four of them um, over this, this landscape in this wetland. And then um, one thing we wanted to look at was the, the activity budget over the course of a day. So looking at hourly um, observational levels. And this is a nocturnal species. Um, so this gray shaded region is showing the kind of typical nightly period throughout the course of a year and identifying the number of observations on this top plot per behavioral states and then breaking these down into proportions on the bottom per state and looking at some of these patterns. So we see that some behavioral states are much more common at the very beginning and end of a nightly active period. Um, others are highly uh, exhibited or frequent throughout the entire period. And others are really infrequent and might only occur like for like one single part of the night. Um, so this might be like one example of what you might do with an activity budget. Uh, additionally, identification of foraging grounds and migratory corridors. So one paper um, that I think has been really um, important in this field is that of uh, Brianna Abrams and colleagues from 2017 looking at African wild dog movements. Um, and they're showing these different movement corridors or potential corridors in relation to the actual tracked wild dog. So each of these plots on the left show a different track from a different individual. And they use these different models to estimate what the potential movement corridor could be. Um, so one model is shown in this like solid filled uh, black or dark gray, and a different model is shown by kind of this hashed or dashed line and filled polygon. So we see in some cases that they are quite different, where one model um, matches up with the actual track much better. Um, but in this last plot, they both appear to be doing about the same job. Um, and on the right is a plot of, um, in this case, Kemp's Ridley turtle foraging areas that have kind of been aggregated for these different grid cells throughout the Gulf of Mexico um, and showing the number of foraging days um, over the course of a tracking period. Um, so this could be useful for managers or other people that are interested in um, protecting or conserving uh, this highly endangered species within the Gulf of Mexico here. And, identifying areas that they might primarily um, stop over at during, during foraging periods. And then kind of the last topic I mentioned previously, uh, looking at these behavioral state habitat associations. And this can be done in a variety of different ways, whether you're estimating habitat selection per behavioral states, um, or alternatively estimating the probability of exhibiting a certain behavioral states um, given some number of environmental variables. Um, so if you're not familiar with these types of models, this can just sound like they're not really any different from each other, um, which is understandable. But again, I'm not going to be focusing so much on this topic uh, for this workshop, um, but it's just to show some examples. So again, from the same wild dog study, um, they have these different coefficients from their two models. So the one model is shown in red, the other in green here on this plot on the left. Um, and we see in some cases that the, the coefficient estimates are really similar between models, but in others, they're almost opposites. Um, so highlighting this importance that you might have one surface, like a least cost resistant surface for a model that includes all behavioral states together and doesn't um, assume that they uh, have different preferences based on these behaviors, or one that actually does account for, let's say, like a migratory or dispersal 
behavior and is trying to estimate the preferences during that behavioral state. Um, and then alternatively, the, the giant armadillo study I referenced before, um, if you have behavioral states and you want to look at the potential probability that they are exhibiting a given behavior for different values of environmental variables you're looking into, um, you could potentially look at, the, in this case, the proportion of land use land cover variables. So uh, things such as forest or open savanna, floodable grasslands, and how different proportions of each of these land classes um, might impact the probability of being in one behavior versus another. Um, so this is just like a sampling of the possibilities that you would use after you've <laughs> estimated the behavioral states. So a lot of times the behavioral states themselves aren't the end goal. They're kind of an intermediate step um, to these, these next analyses. Um, and there's a general, uh, in general, there's a variety of different satellite telemetry transmitters. And again, I'm not going to focus so much on acoustic telemetry today, um, but just to show that there are different different types of tags that you may need to account for some of their nuances. Um, in terrestrial environments in general, they typically use some form of GPS. Um, sometimes a GPS is linked to different uh, cell towers, essentially, so the GPS GSM. And then there's also things such as light level geolocation that kind of take into account the angle of the sun um, to estimate the, the location on, on the planet. Um, in a marine environment, satellite uh, transmitters often involve Argo satellites, which use this Doppler shift uh, approach, which is different from GPS and tends to be um, more error prone. There's also things such as PSAT or pop-up satellite archival tags so this is really useful for animals that don't surface um, because you can't really transmit these signals to a satellite when they're underwater. Um, so for especially fish species um, that almost never surface if at all, um, these tags will stay on and just archive all of the data essentially. And then after a certain duration, they'll pop off to the surface and then send those signals to a satellite to be relayed to that, that person um, and a lot of times if they're recovered, you could download even more higher resolution data. And then something that's becoming more common is the use of fast log GPS in uh, air breathing marine animals. And um, this provides locations that are um, similar in accuracy to actual GPS, um, but in animals that tend to be underwater a lot of the time. So um, it's more accurate than these, these Argos positions. And then just to show freshwater, um, they almost never use satellite telemetry just due to the nature of um, the basins themselves. Maybe they're constrained by a river. And if you have a lot of error, it's going to show them basically on land, probably the majority of the time instead of actually in the water. Um, so they tend to almost entirely use acoustic telemetry. But there are some instances where uh, satellite telemetry has been used. Um, and since we will be using primarily Argos mixed with fast log GPS data today, I want to give a brief overview of what that data looks like. Um, so I mentioned Argos satellite telemetry data are relatively error prone. Um, and one thing that you'll get in kind of your, your data sets when you download them is this location class variable, um, often abbreviated as LC, and you get these different values associated with different levels of quality. Um, so the, these values are three, two, one, zero, A, B, and Z, or Z. Um, and this is in decreasing quality. So if you have a location that's of quality class three, um, this is the highest quality for Argos, and this tends to be less than 250 meters. Um, and this only increases as you kind of go down this list. Um, anything that's worse than zero doesn't even have an accuracy estimates, so A and B. And it just so happens that those tend to make up the majority of the observations that people will get. So um, it's really important to try to um, clean up this data set. Otherwise, you're throwing out a bunch of data that is often really expensive to um, collect. And then if you have some locations that are labeled Z or Z, um, these are essentially considered invalid locations. And these are typically tossed out. Um, and these values, these ranges of errors um, are what's reported by Argos 
but there have been other studies that actually measure them empirically to see how accurate these estimates of error are. Um, and there are some discrepancies. And in some cases, these errors can be much larger. So um, instead of just like one and a half kilometers for something greater than zero, they could be on the order of tens of kilometers. Um, so there's no way to really know how bad the error is in, on some of these observations, especially labeled A or B. Um, so it's really important that you're able to account for this location error if you do have Argo satellite telemetry um, being used to collect your data. All right, so with that, we will move on to the next step with doing some initial data exploration. Um, so we're gonna jump right into R.